So, friends, good morning, welcome to this lecture series of uh, geomorphology. And uh, today we will discuss about this coastal geomorphology. We will continue with this series which were continuing in the previous class. So, in the last class, if you remember, we are talking something about this web tap experiment on which three types of wave we are generating. One is the standing wave, it is away from this cliff, and one type of wave which was hitting the coast and uh, that is called the breaking wave which was hitting at this cliff and one is the broken wave which was already broken at few distance away from this coast and was hitting this uh, cliff again. And out of these three, the latter two becomes more effective for the erosion and especially the second one becomes uh, more important for erosion which was breaking at the coast only. So, in the third one, though it was eroding this coast, retreating the cliff, but its effectiveness is, uh, is half as the second one. And uh, second thing we discussed that uh, during this uh, wave transform to this coast, at the first instance, the rate of erosion was less because only water was responsible. And the second instance, when it was hitting, sufficient sand was removed from this cliff, this sand and water this become more effective to erosion because the abrasive power of water increased with the addition of some sand. And more and more addition of sand from the cliff, this energy is distributed among the sand grains and that is why the, in the later time the weathering power of this water decreased. So, this was the summary of this last class. So, whatever the experiment we were doing in the laboratory, the only the basal loads we are creating, but here in the real world not only the basal loads will create, because here not only the sand and the cement that is artificial we are creating. So, that is that does not contain any type of fractures, any type of joints like that, because it is freshly uh, constructed material. But in natural sense, when we are going to field, we will find the cliffs, though grains are there, the cementic material is there, uh, with that there will be discontinuous, that is very natural discontinuity like the joints, the bedding planes, the cleavage surface, so the weathering surface. So, there are many other components are there. So, here it will not behave as the laboratory sand and cement slurry or cement material we are used for uh, preparation of cliff, this same type of behavior will not shown by the field material itself. So, that is why at the most of the real cliffs, joints and other discontinues in the rocks mass would cause the entire cliff to retreat, providing more abrasive sediment but also increasing the possibility of sediment buffering of wave energy. So, that means, once we have more joints, more joint planes, the bedding planes, the discontinuity we will remove more material as compared to the our laboratory experiment. So, more material we are removing that means, the less time we are dissipating the wave energy among this material. So, that the rate of erosion will decrease fast as compared to the laboratory system or the laboratory experiment. Similarly, that material which was removed will create the depositional platform here. So, that means, the depositional platform will move straight and forming a convex up system. So, that is why the coastal retreat will be there and same times the depositional ramp will be developed. With stable sea level, abrasion ramp would eventually widen until wave attack becomes infrequent on this cliff face when it would become a vegetated subdued hill slide. So, that means, when this continue, when there will be less frequent wave attack will be there and when cliff will be vegetated. So, that will be less effect, this erosion will be less affected. In a many bold cliffed coast of the world, uh, another reminder of this essential disequilibrium between coastal landforms and the present day sea level. So, if you see there are three photographs given of this world uh, coastal systems, 
this is somewhere it is straight, somewhere it is you see whatever the mass wasting is there, the material is lying here and here mass wasting and some material is lying here. That means, it is not the product of this present day sea level, it is the product of sea level of changing many times, many times the sea level have changed from this geological past of the present. So, ultimate product is what we are looking in front of us. So, that means, in this world whatever the cliff retreat is there, whatever the cliff situation there, whatever the abrasion ramp is there, what is the depositional platform is there, it is not this product of today only. It is the product of subsequent uh, weathering, subsequent uh, wave action, subsequent material removal and sub again build up, again sea level fluctuation of, of, uh, of going and down going of sea level of the, that, like that. So, it is a complete product of many processes that is started from the geological past and continuing at the present time. Now, we will discuss about the structural control on shore zone landform, structural control, how the rock structure, whether rock structure is horizontal, rock is dipping, rock is gently dipping, it is vertically dipping, it is jointed, it is not jointed. So, whatever the rock structure along this rock, along this material, uh, along this cliff, how that behaves as uh, defining the coastal geomorphology or the uh, equilibrium or disequilibrium coast generations. Resistant rocks on coast tend to produce seaward as well as to man, maintain higher elevations. Even though wave refraction focuses more energy onto the headlands of the resistant rock, they continue to form headlands as erosion progresses. If you remember when we are talking about the wave advance towards the coast and interaction with this coastal geomorphic system, we found when there are convex slope, that means when there is a convex form of landforms, that means that is called headland, that means a patch of land which is intruding into the sea. For example, if you see here, this is the part of land which is intruding into the sea. Similarly, it is a part of land intruding into the sea. This is intruding into the sea. This is, you see here, it is a part of land intruding into the sea. These are called headlands. And we know when we are talking about the wave advance towards the headland or towards the coast, whenever there is a headland, that means there is a breaker zone available somewhat below it and somehow distance from these headlands. And these headlands, they behave as a wave to converge. So, converging wave, that means wave is a form of energy. So, that means wave energy is converging there and more energy is converging and more energy it is interacting with the headlands, that means more erosion is there. So, that means a concave surfaces, they are the sites of a deposition and convex surfaces of land, they are the sites of erosion, they are called headlands. So, now the question arises, if a wave is coming off and it is interacting with the system, with, uh, interacting with the coast, these convex sites or the headlands, they are prone to weather and the concave side, they are prone to receive sediment to deposit. So, that there uh, after few millions of years or thousands of or lakhs of years, there will be equilibrium coast will be generated. So, now the headlands they are consuming, they are consuming energy and here this mainland it, it is cut off from the mainland with a small neck. Now, if you see in this figure where here you see this is the headland, this is headland, this is headland. Now, you see here the wave energy they are concentrating here, they are concentrating here. So, more energy is concentrated here and energy is used you see it is disappearing, it is diverging. So, here less energy, so it is less, it is more. So, more energy will concentrate, that means it more erosion will take place. Similarly, here these are the sites of deposition, these are the sites of erosion. Similarly, here this will be the sites of erosion and this should be the sites of deposition. So, that means I want to say with more and more energy concentration, more and more erosion of these headlands, the wave refraction around a protruding headlands can be so extreme that only a narrow neck of land is left, connecting a peninsula to the mainland. Here, this is the peninsula, 
it is and the mainland it is a narrow neck is existing here through this narrow neck it is connecting to this mainland system. Suppose we have sedimentary rocks very horizontal strata, horizontal strata we have resistant non resistant type of rocks are there. So, in horizontal strata there is a particular or peculiar erosional structure which is found and uh, it is called the arc. If you see here this is called arc, now you see this is the arc shaft. So, with more and more erosion with more and more quarrying of material this arc is removed. Once this arc is removed with geological time this becomes a an independent pillar. For example, if you see here in the second figure if you transfer this idea here now you see this is an independent pillar this is independent pillars. So, once of a geological past it was like this this arc shaped features was there. So, due to more and more erosion this arc has been removed and finally, isolated pillars or it is called pinnacles if you see here it is pinnacles or C stack it is standing on the shore platform. So, in suitable structures especially flat like sedimentary rocks wave erosion may query through the wreck creating a natural arc with further erosion arc collapse leaving isolated pinnacles or sea stacks standing on the shore platform. So, this is all about your sea stacks or pinnacles and uh, how the rock structure they are affecting the system and shore platforms on nearly flat lying sedimentary rocks are especially difficult to interpret in terms of uh, and that is wave cut platforms. It was noted that water level weathering takes advantage of the pre existing bands. So, the pre existing bands is there the terraces is there. So, water level weathering that means, if water level weathering that is contain water within that. So, once water remains within the system because the bedding planes the joint planes they are the weak planes. So, water if it remains within that that means, it is promote further weathering. In horizontal strata structural benches readily form and may hold enough water to promote water level weathering at several different interval intertidal and supratidal levels simultaneously. That means, we have already discussed once we have the bedding planes are there we have web curve platform is there and bedding planes the joint planes horizontal strata are there they can contain water within that and water contain within water uh, remaining within that that means, it promotes the water level weathering. So, whatever so far we are discussing about this destructional landforms that is erosional landforms. So, from now onward we will discuss about the constructional or depositional landforms along this coast. Deposition that means, we have removed the material through notches, we have removed the material from this uh, mass wasting processes and that material will be redistributed with the wave with the tide and how at the coast they are forming those landforms. In addition to that some of these landforms which are biogenic landforms like this uh, coral reefs how they are forming on this deposited material or the hard rocks and uh, that will be discussed here. And uh, in the constructional landform along this shore line the organic reef or the coral reefs are the most prominent one. So, reefs are shallow water submarine landforms they are submarine landform and shallow water why shallow water because organism is involved there they will remain within the photic zones up to which sunlight can penetrate. So, that means, these are the shallow water processes and shallow water landforms. The term is usually applied to solid rocky structures rather than to sandbars, solid and rocky structures, sandbars are excluded here, sandbars they are the dynamics one, at the coast we have already discussed there will be Vulcanoids, okay. there will be transverse dunes are there. So, these sand dunes are excluded here and uh, only the rocky structures, rock structures, the hard rock structures there are included. Most reefs are constructed by 
marine organisms although some are structurally controlled shallow submerged leads such as hogbacks, dikes and lava flows. So, these landforms that is this organic landforms they are mostly they are uh, built by marine organisms, but some of these landforms they are may formed by this lava flow like the hogback structures and structurally controlled of the pre paleogeographic landforms the paleo landforms are there, but mostly when we are talking about the organic reefs the coral reefs we are talking about this reef system which are developed by the organisms here. And uh, at the base of this organic reef there may be hard rock substrate like basalt like this uh, hogback structures like this paleogeographic landforms which are written at the paleogeographic changes. So, that means on the soft rocks like clay sand on the loose materials these type of organic reefs will not develop. So, whatever the organic reefs have so far discussed or so far discovered wild oceans they are developed on the hard rock substrate even if it is a small patch of hard rock is there they becomes fast to create to initiate this reef system we need it needs a hard rock. And once first the initial system is developed again within that reef it becomes again the substrate for the further growth of this reef itself. So, the basement for this reef we need a hard rock substrate rather than soft clay or loose sand. Reefs are built up in shallow water to take advantages of sunlight for photosynthesis to shed or stay above smoothing detrital mud and to provide a large surface area for continuous growth. So, that means we need a hard rock substrate. Reefs are usually well adapted to local wave and tidal energy, so that they are nourished by the energy expenditure of the wave and currents rather than being destroyed by them. So, they are so suitably arranged that they absorb this energy rather than they destroyed by the energy. They can adjust with the energy condition, they, an, uh, they are adjust with the waves, they can move along this wave, but not detached from their surface. So, their growth is likely that they will be in the hard rock substrate, they will firmly attached to it, they will adjust themselves with this uh, energy with a wave either either wave or tide and that will not detached from the system until unless there will be heavy storms or like that. So, what are the geomorphic requirement for this coral growth? If you see here reefs growth is best in water that does not cool below 18 degree Celsius during winter month also. So, here the temperature plays an important role. So, the temperature should be more than 18 degree that means, it is not a cold water phenomena. Whatever the if you say it is cold water reefs and warm water reef. So, that cold water means it should not be cool than 18 degree Celsius okay. and warm water it may be anything whatever the warm water environment available, but the cold water reefs that should not be less than 18 degree. Salinity should be close to normal again salinity it should not be hyper saline it should be saline should be there because world oceans are saline. So, salinity should be there, but it should be close to normal. So, that means, there are particular geographic locations, particular geological conditions, there are requirement particular biological condition, EHPH condition, light conditions, they should be fixed. So, that it will promote for coral growth. Then fresh water from this rivers or torrential rain is especially damaging. So, that means, fresh water it should not reach up to their level. So, it is a saline, but it should not be hyper saline, it is saline is a normal temperature must not drop below 18 degree Celsius, it should be away from fresh water influence. A hard substrate is necessary for the colony to become established, but small patch reefs can grow on soft sediment and gradually fuse to form suitable base. Here hard rock substrate it is requirement is there hard rock substrate to the if even if soft rock it develops, but within few time they will themselves coalescence and form the hard rock 
for themselves for their growth. So, that means soft rock should not be there, rock should be hard. Loose sand is poor for coral growth as in mud, as we have discussed, there it should be hard rock substrate rather than soft rock. So, these are the geological conditions, their essential requirement for the growth of coral and formation of coral reef. If you see this is the world distribution of coral reef in this map, see in this Indian Ocean we have coral reef and this is the great barrier reef in Australia which is moving about 2000 kilometers or so. And these are this world distribution of this coral reef and finally, warm water coral reef, reef cells and provinces if you see here this type of warm water systems are there that means and cold water it should not be less than 18 degree. So, these are some of this example the color was given and this is here is a warm water this red lines or the red dots and this cold water this is this blue dots, but cold water once we say cold water that means it should not less than 18 degree Celsius. Then we will discuss about this coral reef morphology. What is coral reef morphology? A coral reef is an enormous mass of limestone that is organically built. So, it is a limestone that means calcium carbonate. So, that means those organisms they, they grow or they consume calcium carbonate and their body is made up of calcium carbonate. So, it is a limestone. The seaward edge of this reef especially on the windward coast is where wave resistant growth forms thrive in the most nutrient rich environment and provide coralline detritus to the largest quantities. Some detritus back off from the reef and from the main body and form four arc talus on the ocean side of the reef. If you see here, this is the seaward side and here this whatever the wave energy is coming it is directly hitting here. So, here mostly the wave resistant species they are they tend to grow here and this wave resistant species once there is water is coming and hitting here mostly the nutrient supply most nutrient will be here. So, that means those areas will be very significant in development of strong and stout corals and mostly this energy with that means those uh, corals have energy enough to resistant the wave attack. So, most powerful coral species they are found in this part of this uh, uh, coral reef. Other commonly finer detritus is swept across the reef into the sheltered region this is wave and it this wave resistant species will be there and uh, some of this detritus which breaking from the system and uh, it is forming uh, this talus here this submarine talus in the coral reef talus and this finer material they are transported this way and forming here this is the back reef system this finer material which has broken off from this system and it is depositing across it and these are the area where this generally the calm and quiet water corals the less resistant corals they are found in the here. In the surf zone on this extreme seaward rim of many Indo-Pacific reefs calcareous algae build smooth rounded mounds on it and this is very important. This calcareous algae once they build up on the coral reef they becomes a binders they act as binders. So, that means the coral fragments the coral reefs they bind together and becomes more and more resistant to the wave actions. The algal limestone is more dense than coral limestone and it is a vital contributor to reef stability. This algal it is also limestone. So, the algal limestone they will grow here somewhere and this algal limestone they becomes a binder to bind these corals together, but the algal limestone is more dense than the coral limestone. Hence, it is vital contributor to reef stability. If you see here these are this uh, calcareous algae and this algal development is there 
So, once the algal development grow and finally, they bind these corals from the top on this some or towards their body and this becomes more strong and more resistant for their growth. More delicate coral species grow in the lee side of the seaward reef adding more detrital sediment. Here this side it will grow here more delicate one either a sandy lagoon floor or an intertidal reef flat may extend from the leeward side. If you see this is the leeward side, this is topward side and from here whatever the resistant species will be there, they grow and finally, this is the less resistant species will be towards this. This side is the lagoon, this side is the open sea, this is the barrier and this side is the lagoon. So, your finer material will be here and this less resistant species will be in this side. There are certain salient features about this coral reef. The coral reefs are generally limited in upward growth to mean low tide level. So, they cannot growth aerially. So, their maximum growth is to the low tide level will be there. The extreme productivity of the reef provides sediments for the many subaerial shore zone landforms. However, large storms and tsunamis tear away tons of reef front coralline debris and hurl it on this algal rim into the reef flat behind. So, here it is very important to understand. The extreme productivity of the reef provides sediments for many subaerial landforms, whatever the landform if you go to this Mauritius you know, around that area where the islands are there, African islands are there, not this uh, Pacific islands are there. So, this coral reefs they are transported by this wave action, the part of the detritus of the coral reefs they are transported by this wave action and forming the coast. So, the coastal will be very odd smell is there because this everywhere there will be coral and coral, wherever you go you will find a part of coral, a piece of coral is there. So, some of the subaerial landform close to this coast they are also formed by the deposition of this coral broken away from the system. And if we have large tsunamis, so large tsunamis can uh, make it dissect uh, these corals into different pieces and broken into pieces and finally, that will move landward and it will may distribute within that lagoons, within that corals itself, within that uh, algal mat itself. So, that means it redistributes the systems. Most reef plots are scattered with large block of storm tossed coral rocks often deeply notched by the solutions. So, that means here if you see this figure, here if you see this figure whatever the corals develop here if tsunami comes from the side and tsunami that means it is dissect the material and it will redistribute here and here and here and sometimes it becomes and the some some area landform close to the coast are formed by the tsunami activities. On the reef flat, islands of coralline sand and gravels may build up high enough to support vegetation and storage of fresh water. This is very interesting to understand here. Now, see this is the growth of coral and finally, this is the habitable islands. And once this type of situation occurs, there may be a fresh water table within that coral reef and this fresh water table is due to raining, due to rain water there will be water percolation and the fresh water will be here. Why fresh water will be? Because fresh water is less dense as compared to marine water. So, marine water will be at the bottom and the fresh water will be at the top. So, finally, it will create this type of situation if the coral reef grows above from the sea level, but it is not possible, but it is only possible if the sea level falls, it remains there. Okay. So, major storm can remove an uncemented part of this coral reef islands, but if a mass of debris is not disturbed for few decades of hundreds of years or centuries, it becomes relatively indurated and resistant. Cementation is generally close to the level of mean high tide 
in the zone of saturation. Because of the tidal range in tropical ocean is generally less than 2 meters, low platform of cemented reef rubbles are exposed on most eroding shores. And these cemented high tide platforms have been frequently mistaken by the geologist and they think that the, as if they are the emerged coastline of the Holocene, but this is nothing. This is due to this high tide and low tide, the cementation occurs up to this level. So, this is sometimes mistaken. So, whenever you go to the field and you are working in this coastal plains, you must be cautious about what actually you are looking at. Either it is a, a high tide platform or it is mistaken for the emerged platform due to the decrease of sea level. So, I think we should stop here and we will meet in the next class. Thank you very much.